Welcome to the road to growth, success of an entrepreneur. We've raised the block. Learn firsthand from successful business owners and create your own path to success. I'm going to show you how great I am. It's time to hit the road to growth with team lead of the Enriquez Group, Realtor Vinny. Hi, you Road to Growth listeners. Today, I got Matthew Sullivan. Uh, he is the CEO and founder of Quantum RM, or RE, sorry, Quantum RE. Yeah, this one right here, I was did a deep dive into, into you, Matthew, before you came on. And being in the real estate field, right, looking yes. at what your company offers, it's so intriguing. I mean, I've, I've heard of something, something like this. It might have been your company. I heard about it a couple of years ago. I never really did a deep dive into it. And um, from what... I saw with that company, it didn't allow the individual to invest in the actual properties too. Yes. So it only allowed the, the homeowner to partner up with the, the company, yes. but didn't allow the other aspect of it. So it's it's a very unique thing if uh, hopefully everyone listening is going to get some great nuggets right here. Um, but this is at least, at least for myself and hopefully my listeners, a well, very intriguing one right there. Thank you. And Vinny, thank you very much for having me on. Yeah. So we talked about a little before we got on mic uh, about your background. I mean, I mean, the idea of it, you think, OK, maybe he was a, a lender. Maybe he was in the real estate field and he just saw the unique opportunity come about. But I looked at the, the whole opposite way. You were in kind of the, the crowd fund, crowdfunding business and kind of just an out of the box thinker. Yes. Where did this I mean, happen? well, my background is really quite, you know, it is entrepreneurial uh, okay. in the sense that I've you know, the last 25 plus years, um, I've you know, been building my own businesses. And, you know, mainly that's because I was just, you know, completely unemployable. Um, so, <laughs> um, but the businesses I had, I moved over here to the US um, seven and a half, eight years ago. Uh, okay. But before that, I had a number of businesses that were platform based. So they were internet, they were technology based businesses. Um, but they were, um, my latest, last business was, um, um, in you know environmental assets, but, but before that, um, I was heavily involved in in lending, as you say. So it was in residential lending. So this was in um, you know a number of years ago when, uh, for a few years, we ran a successful mortgage packaging business. And what that means is that we would work with multiple lenders. We would have uh, borrowers, and we would package the deals together and then send them over to the borrowers. Um, when I moved over here, I came with a fairly solid sort of background in you know internet and platforms and finance um but was still very much intrigued with how we can put all of this together again in the US and at that time the jobs act um had recently been um, passed and that completely opened up the ability for people to offer investments online um and be able to generally solicit in other words be able to advertise private placements on online platforms and that really gave birth to crowdfunding and um in the last you know seven eight years there have been a number of incredibly successful real estate crowdfunding companies but um when i was on that uh, journey i came across this really interesting asset class which is the ability to buy into the equity of residential homes where they were owner occupied because everything else i come across were rental properties or investment properties or commercial properties. But this investment or this opportunity, this agreement, this contract allowed you to invest in essentially properties that were not for sale and participate in the equity. And, and this was, you know, five something years ago. Um, but it, it was just intriguing. But there were a number of um challenges associated with raising the capital for that um you know an equity investment doesn't provide cash flow uh, and also these agreements are quite long dated in the sense that you know the homeowner can stay in the home for up to 30 years before the contract has to be settled so there were a few you know things there that we had to sort of scratch our heads about and try and figure out how we could solve those but you know four years ago we came up with a solution where we could marry some of the really interesting technological developments that have come out of the blockchain together with this asset class to create a marketplace where if we could trade these equity interests and we could use the blockchain 
as the underlying technology to be able to tokenize and fractionalize and trade these assets, then we could potentially solve the problem of liquidity, solve the problem of not having any cash pay, and open up what is essentially a $23 trillion untapped marketplace. So that's that, – sorry, I, I hope I'm answering your question. I just – No, 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 yeah. no, no, definitely, no. I, I mean, it's – yeah, and like – there's so many questions now, and I want to get into your story about who you are. I just have one more question about the, the platform. So you can buy basically how you advertise it is that you're they're selling a piece of their property in essence, right? For well, the homeowners. Yes. The answer is yes and no. What you're okay. doing is you're as a homeowner, we're enabling you to access the equity that's trapped in your home without having to borrow money. Yeah. And we do that because we're investors and not lenders. And the important thing, though, is that we don't go on title as owners. So we have an agreement with the homeowner, which is structured in a very similar way to an option agreement, where the homeowner says, OK, if you give me um, a lump sum and we'll agree what that lump sum is based on an agreed value of my home, when my home, when I sell my home, which can be any time in the next 30 years, I will give you back the amount that you originally invested together with a share of the amount that my house has gone up in value. Uh, and so the, for the investor, they are equity investors. They're not lenders. What they're doing is they are betting on the house going up in value. And historically, we know over any 10-year period, residential properties tend to go up in value so the investor gets the opportunity to piggyback on that equity appreciation but they don't have any of the costs or uh, you know uh, frictions or you know issues associated with actually owning the property so the investor doesn't have to worry about toilets termites tenants trash you know the usual stuff they don't have to worry about collecting the rent because all of those things are managed by the owner so what they're doing is they're simply you know piggybacking off that equity appreciation and what our marketplace does is enables those interests those home equity agreements to be chopped into little pet pieces and then and then bought and sold between buyer and seller makes sense makes sense and so if the the market goes up if the 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 homeowner sells when the market goes down it's basically you're you're basically getting your percentage yeah, if, the, yeah if the market goes down uh, as an equity investor there's a risk um that yeah. the investor could lose money if if the homeowner yeah. sells their home at a significantly lower price than the price that we went in yeah there is a there is a risk but we mitigate that risk by making sure that there's always a 20 to 25 percent equity cushion after we do our transaction so that means oh. that the homeowner the homeowner still has a big chunk of equity left so they don't feel disenfranchised or that they've suddenly you know got no ownership they've, they've still got skin in the game yeah. and also because of that there's a, a discount that we build into the agreement just in case the property doesn't appreciate or goes down so the agreements are effectively starting out from day one with a little bit of built-in return mm. so the property would need to depreciate by you know 30 40 percent and be sold at that significantly lower value before our investors run any risk of losing money makes sense now let's so you talked about it that you're more of a kind of an entrepreneur right so growing up was it starting your own businesses or what what did you do like what did matthew look like as a as a teen oh oh horrific <laughs> no, no i think there was i mean looking back you know what do they say the older i get the better i was um <laughs> But, you know, I think there was always this burning desire to do something, which was incredibly frustrating. I remember being at university in my, you know, late teens and early 20s. So this burning idea to sort of do something, but not knowing what to do. And I've studied law at university. So you try and throw yourself into that. Um, but you want to, it's this feeling that you can't quantify. And it's this feeling that you want to do something, create something. And I think over the years, I sort of realized that what that feeling is, it's this need or desire to create something, to build something, to make something. 
Um, it's the the joy of creation of of seeing new things and and trying to plug into those things and make them become real. Um, and that's great. But in a business context, that's not always great because you can be attracted to the next shiny object. So what you learn over the years is that creativity is a great thing, but it has to be married to pure dogged determination. So on one side, okay, it's fair enough that you like building stuff and creating stuff, but nothing's going to work unless you've got the determination to actually see it through. Um, so, so I think as a, as a, as an, as a teen or as a, you know, in my twenties, you know, um, fascinated by all these different things, wanted to, um, now I never wanted to be employed. I didn't know that at the time specifically, but, um, I always, you know, found myself wanting to be, um, part of the management team or to get involved with the nuts and bolts of the business or you know how things worked or why are we doing it this way which was incredibly irritating to anyone um that you know that I had to work with or or under um so again I apologize profusely to all of those people that I've ever worked with or worked for rather well when did you take the reins I mean it sounds like after uh university you basically were working for companies. Well, I, yeah, I went into I was I went into insurance and then I went into, into stockbroking. So, um, in my mid twenties, um, I had three years working in the insurance sector straight out of university, um, and then I went to London. I sort of became a stockbroker, but I, I got a job as a stockbroker working on the Far East markets. So that's Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand. The ASEAN Tigers at the time. And this was, you know, 88. Um, so it was a year after um, a rather uh, nasty correction in the global stock markets. Um, these markets were incredibly exciting because they were new. Um, I remember we were the first non-Thai uh, company to get a, a license for the Thai stock exchange. Um, so these were and I would go out to that region at least twice a year, spend a few weeks out there visiting companies, writing research and, um, you know, did that for you know three or four years. Uh, but then after that, with a couple of the guys that I worked with, um, I joined them. They set up a small corporate finance company um, based in Kensington in London, which happened to be a stone's throw away from where Richard Branson had his offices. Um, and it so happened that one of the investments that we made was a hot air balloon company run by a, um, a very character, uh, um, uh, an incredible character called Per Lindstrand. Um, and Per Lindstrand had built hot air balloons that Richard Branson had flown in previously. My boss at the time, Rory, Rory uh, had always wanted to fly around the world in a hot air balloon. And so he wrote to Richard and said, you know, dear Richard, um, we own this hot air balloon company. Um, going around the world in a hot air balloon is the last great adventure that hasn't been done. You know, how about it? You should be the pilot. So he wrote back and said, dear Rory, why not? Uh, and so, you know, in the late 90s, about 10 years after, you know, after I'd been a stockbroker, we found ourselves becoming great friends with Richard and the Virgin Group and building this hot air balloon to try and fly him around the world. How long did it take him to fly around? Uh, well, no, it's a different story. So um, <laughs> it's quite difficult to do it, you know. I mean, it's quite difficult yeah. to <laughs> design. I think he got halfway round after a couple of attempts, after three attempts, um, which was, you know, pretty good enough. I still, and then, uh, and then Bertrand Picard came along with a slightly, you know, better mousetrap, um, and and um, flew around as well. Um, and there's a, a, a couple of other characters that it was it was a fascinating time because it attracted all of the great um, explorers, you know, and um, Steve Fawcett. I'm not sure if, if you remember him, who tragically died in a plane crash a few years later. Um, you know, the great adventurers all converged um, in, uh, you know, the uh, you know, north of, um, in, you know, north of France in um I can't remember in the Atlas Mountains and um and, and you know there were these huge meetings of uh, all these great people that were just about to do the last great adventure on earth so um yeah it was it was marvelous just being part of that 
what do you think you you learn from that time frame? I mean, you, you surround yourself by these adventurers, these affluent individuals, or you or you taken away from them. Well, um, funnily enough, one of the guys that I had dinner with, um, as you know, was was uh, none other than Mr. Buzz Aldrin. So this was a few years back. So, um, but to answer your question, um, having been surrounded by these fantastic people, I just wish. I knew then what I know today because I would have just, you know, I, I was, you're in awe of these people and your jaw drops and you're walking around like a deer caught in the headlines, um, you know, because I was in my you know, late 20s, early 30s. Um, it was just fantastic. And I think that just being surrounded by that energy, the ability that, you know, just seeing things like that being done, you know, rather than people saying, oh, no, we can't do it. It's just that can do feeling that anything is possible this is how these things happen watching that whole process from the idea to actually having people try and fly around the world in a hot air balloon which which you know is is a massive task is a massive uh, you know uh, undertaking you know it's, it's you know the just everything the logistics um from just the construction trying to get permissions to fly over certain airspace and not get shot down by you know various you know uh, unfriendly fighters uh, all of those things just the the complexity the the magnitude of it and and the people involved so um just being able to sort of bask in the reflected glow of those people i think um must have done something positive what do you i mean and i mean i know you guys had a a plan for uh richard branson to fly across the uh the world right now being or in a hot air balloon being that he only went halfway right you didn't technically accomplish your finalized goal well it didn't really matter because it um because it, it was just the the i can't remember exactly how far he got i know that um we didn't quite make it but then again um it didn't really matter you know because there was so much that had been achieved um and what it did is um it spurred this race to fly around as is which bertrand picard subsequently won you know, if, you know oh, relatively oh. soon afterwards so there's no point going back and being the second person yeah. to go around the world in a hot air balloon um well, but it's well, just that whole you know the fact that, okay it's not you don't see it as a failure you, yeah. you know there's, there's so many things it was still a great adventure and a great attempt well um, that, i mean that's but, what i'm getting to is the idea that you had an original goal yet it, it wasn't it didn't go as planned yet you find positivity in basically the change of that goal. I mean, people yeah, can because look you, you achieve yeah. so many things on the way yeah. that the actual ultimate goal becomes almost irrelevant. Okay. You know, in other words, there's, um, again, if you try and do things like that, try and, you know, so-called moonshots or big, hairy, audacious goals, you know, they don't always pay off, yeah. but you know, just cause you shoot for the moon and you land on the roof, it, you know, it doesn't mean to say that you haven't, actually achieve something um but there was an enormous amount that was achieved overall just in terms of um learning uh, and none of this had been done before you know the balloon itself the design of the balloon was was new very difficult to fly so there's an enormous amount was learned was achieved um through that process and um it, but again what it does is it spurs you on you see how far you've got um you know the fact that you didn't actually get where you thought you wanted to go it doesn't really matter if you look back and say well look at what we've actually done look at what we've achieved you know that's enormous look how far we've come that's that's what you look at and then you say how do we build on that not you know crying into your beer because you didn't you know manage to land on mars or something where do you learn that mindset from because i think there's a lot of people out there that are listening right now that have very big goals and they feel somewhat deflated when they don't get there. But the way you're looking at it, where you're saying, well, look where you actually got got to. Was that something that you you learned from the people you're around? Was that something self self learned? I mean, where did that come from? Um, it's a tricky one because you got to look back and um, a lot of it comes from circumstance. What good is it going to do me? If I sit there just going, oh, God, you know, I'm crap. This deal didn't work out. Woe is me. 
you know, how very Shakespearean. Um, you know, that my life is a Greek tragedy. <laughs> it's so great. You know, congratulations. You're not going to get anywhere. Um, yeah. But then again, you know, trying to sort of look at disasters and say, God, you know, I've really learned something. You know, there are times where things are complete unmitigated disasters. And you've got to appreciate the fact, yeah, okay, that really just did not work out. But, but you can't stop moving. You can't, you have to see them as learning exercises. And there's a lot of, you know, trite phraseology around, you know, in the sense that, you know, every, every failure takes you closer to a success. I mean, it doesn't feel like that at the time, but you've, you've got to, you know, pick yourself up and, and, um, you just got to have that passion to do something. And okay, if it doesn't work, then, you know, there's another deal and another deal will always come along. Something, um, something good will always happen if you put that energy in you just don't what do they say fear is the temporary lack of information so at that point <laughs> you have a temporary lack of information you don't know what's going to happen next so there's no point crying about it you just you know roll up your sleeves and get on with it yeah i think that's that's great fear is temporary lack of information I, that's yeah i don't think i've ever heard that but that's, yeah i love that uh, <laughs> it's not one of mine yeah <laughs> uh all right so so after that what where do you go next you're um i mean you started this kind of this new way of looking something that was possible where do you where do you go next from there um well really i think after um, you know the the Virgin, the, you know Virgin became very closely associated with, with us, and then I really, um, you know, saw all this stuff, but wanted to go out and and I think in the late nineties, a lot of stuff was happening in the internet world, a lot of stuff was happening in um, telecommunications, and you know I'm a I just love technical stuff. I used to when I was at school, um, in the you know, late 70s, early 80s, when computers first came out, I was just fascinated by computers and that sort of technology. So that that was a sort of thing that was under my skin. So I wanted to, you know, get much more involved in that. So I, I left, um, set up a small telecoms company, where what we were doing was buying minutes at wholesale rates from carriers, um, and then connecting businesses up using, you know, various different technologies to those networks so that they could you know, save money on their phone bill, something very simple. But, you know, what you're doing is you're addressing a need, you're solving a problem. I'm offering you something that you're paying $10 for today, and you can have it from me for, for three. How about that? Or for $4, you know, so it's a, a, it was a good business. It was a great business in the sense that every day you're making money, you just sit there watching your billing system, run the numbers, and, you know, you can see, you know, it, it was it was a great business. I sold that business, moved then into um, finance. So we had a finance platform where we were um, packaging uh, mortgages, um, and then we had the sort of 0708 crisis that uh, really sort of destroyed that business. And so I moved into um, you know uh, an environmental business where we were looking at trading environmental assets, like uh, you know it was a, a different marketplace. Um, and then really, I. I think I moved over here, uh, circumstances, my s life circumstances changed. Um, and I moved over here. God, where are we now? 2021, 2014, something like that. 20, 20 2013, um, moved to Southern California, um, and was like a kid in a candy store. We're in uh, Southern California to move to. Wait, say again, sorry. We're in Southern California. Today, in, uh, well, we moved to Orange County. Well, I, I moved into Orange County. So, and that's where we started the business in uh, Newport Beach. Okay. Which, what? Again, you know, which was just fantastic. And I would, you know, still you walk around going, you know, this is California. I moved last year out of California. We moved to just north of Salt Lake City in Utah. And again, mm -hmm. you just fantastic places. You know, I, I still have that same. Uh, you know, schoolboy wonder, you know, it's like when you're a kid and you're going on a train for the first time and you're looking and everything looks new and you're just, you know, mesmerized by it. There, there are days when I will go and walk the dog and, you know, I still thankfully have that feeling of excitement in, that, uh, you know, it's not just another day in paradise. What, um, I mean, out of anywhere in the Un United States, what, what made you come to Orange County? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, uh, yeah, I was uh, the, my. You blame my second wife for that. 
<laughs> was she American? Yeah, she is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. no, no, I mean, I we are married. Yeah, so you so, see, so I, I married um, uh, a rather lovely American girl, uh, and we are still married to, <laughs> although sadly not to each other. Okay. Now that was a joke. That was a joke from four weddings and a funeral, which I. You know, Please, you know, we are still married to each other. You know, please, God, I hope she doesn't hear this because I probably will get. You know. What did you see? Was there any kind of um, uh, acclimation to the United States way of living, mindsets, anything that, that you felt from uh, moving from there? No, no acclimation required um, because the, well, the great thing about this place is it allows you to be yourself. You know, because there's so many different people here that you don't have to fit into anything. Um, so that's the great thing. And uh, what it was that there's obviously you've got a there's slightly different ways of doing things. There's different laws and regulations and, um, you know, different structures. Um, but that was that was the fun. The fun is being able to adapt and having, you know, obviously having um, being from the UK, we've already got that cultural affinity. Um, but there was there was nothing. It was nothing other than pleasurable experiences, and and, and you know meeting people that were far more open. Um, you know, people would discuss things much more and talk about things and share things. So um, it was a it was a real positive surprise and lovely experience to to land here because you get so much sort of immediate encouragement and support and um you know which you wouldn't necessarily get in the uk we tend to be a little bit more reserved in the uk is there uh differences how people look at uh business work um... i think it's much more old-fashioned over here to a certain extent much more mano a mano than you would imagine so even though the place is dripping with technology, um, it's still that feeling that we deal with, we work with people we know, like, and trust. So mm -hmm. underneath all the tech and underneath, um, you know, all of the social media and the, you know, the electronics and the platforms, there's still, I think, more of this feeling that, um, you know, let's do this on a handshake. You know, who are you as a person? Okay. Which, again, is something that... Um, probably was more of the case in the uk and europe i think we may have lost that to a certain extent um but it's prevalent over here it's much more to do with people um personalities you know who are who are you who am i working with how can i trust you um or um you know why would i work with you that's that's uh that's the one thing which was a, a pleasant surprise when so you moved to the the us how long ago uh, let's say seven, seven and a half, eight years. Okay, and then how long ago did you um, uh, start Quantum uh, RE? Four years. So that was December seventeen. So just coming up for four years. Okay. So the from what I understand, right, the the buying process, lending is a little bit different in the UK compared to the US, correct? Uh, it is. Yeah. I mean, there's more regulation because you've got to remember that after um, my lending business in the UK, we had the financial crisis. So you've got all of these, uh, you know, Graham Leach, Sarbanes-Oxley, you've got all of the various different new layers of legislation that came in to lending as a result of the, you know, 07, 08 crisis. So the whole landscape globally uh, changed. Um, so, so in building this, this platform, right, how much new knowledge do you have to accumulate to make it fit for, I guess, the the American um, American or US residential properties. Well, this 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 is a US product through and through. It was never really designed. It was designed from the ground up for okay. the US market. It's a US company. You know, I'm, I'm you know live here permanently. Um, so th this is not something that sort of squeezed a round peg squeezed into a round uh, into a square hole. Um, but you're right. There's there's you, the problem is something that we all understand. So that's universal. The problem is yeah. I'm a homeowner. I have equity. How do I get my hands on it without going deeper into debt? So that's something that I understood from the UK, having been a homeowner, where I've got equity and I don't want to borrow money. Or maybe after 08, I can't borrow money because the rules have changed. Banks have gone bust. Nobody wants to lend you money anymore. 
So I've got this equity and I can't get my hands on it. So the problem is something that I understood. And it was a problem that's the same in the UK as it is in, in the US. So that's a good starting point. In other words, you understand what the problem is. And if you can understand what the problem is, and you found a way that you think can solve that problem, that's the biggest part of the challenge. In other words, have you got a real business there? And then after that, it's really, um, you know, the, the technicalities of the platform, uh, you know, have changed and have evolved, but that's okay because you can run with those changes. And then you've got US securities laws. And um, so that's a, a completely different landscape. There are some commonalities with what happens in the UK, but you know, you get the general idea though. What we're doing is we're creating something. If we're trying to trade these things, then we're in firmly, you know, in the land of securities. So my previous background taught me that, that made me sort of understand how securities work and what the regulatory environment is going to be, or the fact that there is a regulatory environment. So, so, you know, I've had, I found a fantastic attorney very early on who I'm still working with, you know, every day, um, who was a, a, a great or is a great securities attorney who was one of the early adopters of, you know, or early attorneys involved in the crowdfunding world. So, you know, there was a lot of new things to learn, but you understand basically what you've got to learn. So, you know, that I've got to, you've got to find out how this works, how that's going to plug into that. What are the, compliance or regulatory requirements that we need to make this happen. So none of it was fumbling about in the dark, but there was a lot of new stuff, obviously, that, that you know, one had to learn. Well, what do you, I mean, what do you feel has been one of the, the bigger struggles of building this business? I would think being that it's such a un, unique product. Yeah. Would be education. The biggest, but... the biggest challenge um, is explaining to people how this works because people are naturally skeptical. And when you describe the product as a way of unlocking home equity without taking on more debt, no monthly payments, no interest, then the natural skepticism kicks in, it's too good to be true. Mm -hmm. So what we then have to do is make sure that we've got enough um, time with that person to say, look, we do this because we're investors not lenders we don't actually lend you money we're investing so we're taking some risk with you and we do get paid don't worry we're going to make some money out of this but it's just in a different way to what you're used to so yeah. education is the biggest challenge now thankfully over the last three years in particular uh, the number of players in this market have grown the volumes of business has increased significantly and we would estimate that probably about a billion dollars worth of home equity agreements have been signed so far in the last you know two to three years so there's a lot of momentum there's a lot of need now house prices have appreciated significantly whereas at the same time it's you know even more difficult to pay for the groceries it seems so how come how come i'm you know a millionaire on paper yet you know that, that cash flow is still evades me so people are motivated to do something now um, so you have that combination of a difficult sort of cash flow situation for many people house prices have gone up so there's a lot of equity on the table these agreements have been around for a number of years so that, you know we've got a track record we've got a lot of social media out there a lot of things explaining to people how this works you know we've been in business for four years now nearly so that helps so um you know the biggest challenge is here but gradually we're sort of chipping away at that with all of the tools that we have makes sense i mean now if you could look back with all the knowledge you've kind of accumulated and you can look back and talk to that person that just got out of university is there any kind of information advice that you provide to that person yeah i think really it's just get some advice in other words if you're spinning around you know trying to figure out what to do go and talk to someone go and get a mentor or or um you know education is comes in lots of different flavors go and you know work or find someone that has done something interesting that you would like to and then ride on their coattails for a bit and you know get some some guidance um because without data points you don't know which way to go if you can't yeah. see the stars how do you navigate so just spend some time, uh, you know, either in a work environment or, or to, you know, as a, you know, finding a mentor or, you know, take some deep breaths and, you know, just 
make a plan, find a direction, and then stick with it. You know, do something that you love. Um, don't do it because you know. Don't turn a hobby into a into a into a passion. But you know, do something where you think you will enjoy the, you know, mental, emotional, technical, psychological challenges, and just stick with it. You know, uh, to a certain extent, I wish I had kept my telecoms business. It was growing ferociously, and I think now, you know, 10, 15, 20 years on, it will be huge. It'll be worth hundreds of millions because, you know, if I'd stuck at it, I would have. Um, but I was just tempted to to sell and, you know, um, do something else. But sticking at something, become an expert, become a subject matter expert, become known, be, you know, because so many people start things and then gradually and they fall away. You know, if you're there, you become the icon, you become the the paramount of knowledge for that particular field. And, and that's where the, you know, the real value and the growth begins. I mean, and, and to, to finish off one last question, I just want to say before I ask the question, thank you, Matthew, for being on the Road to Growth podcast. Um, the last question I just want to ask, if, if we had you on the podcast in five years from now, where do you see Quantum RE? Where do you see yourself? Where do you see real estate as a whole? Well, I think I, I'm still uh, very much fascinated and full of uh, uh, enthusiasm for what we're doing with, uh, with quantum. Um, and so I think in um, a few years time, um, it will be the same quantum will be bigger, we will have much more um, uh, adoption we will have much more uh, in, you know, um, education will have sort of spread out. I'm sorry, my son is trying to break in my office. <laughs> I want to go. <laughs> yes, my sons will be older at that point, so they will be able to. You know, but but um, uh, yeah, I think I just love quantum. I, I just am so excited about what we're doing and seeing it evolve and seeing people um, become part of it, both on the homeowner side and the investor side. Um, and, you know, I don't see myself going on to bigger, better things. You know, this is a project that can grow and grow. And, and it actually does do some good. You know, it helps people that couldn't previously have raised money. And, and, to, and to be able to unlock a couple of hundred thousand dollars, um, you know, can really change people's lives. And it's their money. So they're not, you know, they're not having to, you know, go back into, you know, back into debt to do it. Um, so I am and always have been really excited about this because for me, it's everything I've ever wanted. It's, you know, it's the technology side, it's building, it's creating, it's finance, it's securities, it's solving problems. It's something I'm proud to talk about. Um, and, um, you know, long may that last. Well, I, I appreciate it again, Matthew, for being on the Road to Growth podcast. I mean, I know after this uh, interview, I'm going to go on there and dive deeper. I'm really curious about the investment a aspect of that because I, yes, I hear it's, it it's live ish. So we don't have, okay. we, we've got inventory coming on in a few weeks. So it's okay. recently launched. It's, um, you know, all the infrastructure is there. We're, we're just, you know, in the process of putting some deals on. So, you know, it's going to change and grow exponentially in the next few months. Okay. Well, perfect then. Well, then I'm going to have it on my calendar to check it in a, in a month or two. But no, but do go and look now anyway, okay. just in case. <laughs> yes. okay. All right. Perfect. Well, thank you again for, for being here. Hopefully thank everyone you, listening it's got been some, a pleasure. Some, Thanks for having some me on. great nuggets right there. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's, I think too much to talk about right there. Appreciate you again, Matthew. Hope everyone, please subscribe, please share and go look up Matthew. All his information is in the show notes. Bye guys.